Greetings, everyone. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we saw Ronin making his way at the command of Deathwing to the uh, to K Grimbatal or wherever it is that uh, yeah Grimbatal and the orc specifically Necros. They know that he's on the way, or they know some force is on the way, and they're trying to create a sort of a bait situation where they put Alex Strasse out front. Uh, to me, that seems like that, that could work to their disadvantage. All right, so we are now beginning the second half of the novel. Stay a while and listen to chapter 12 of The Day of the Dragon. Lord Prester's Ascension... Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Gotta do some voices here. Lord Presta's ascension seems almost inevitable. The shadowy form in the Emerald Sphere informed Krasis. He has an almost amazing gift of persuasion. You are correct. He must be a wizard. Seated in the midst of his sanctum, Krasis eyed the globe. Convincing the monarchs will require much evidence. Their mistrust of the Kirin Tor grows with each day, and that can only also be the work of this would-be king. The other speaker, the elder woman from the inner council, nodded back. We've begun watching. The only trouble is this Prester proves very elusive. He seems able to enter and leave his abode without us knowing. Krasis pretended slight surprise. How is that possible? We don't know. Worse, his chateau is surrounded by some very nasty spellwork. We almost lost Drendon to one of those surprises. That Drendon, the baritoned and bearded mage, had nearly fallen victim to one of Deathwing's traps momentarily dismayed Krasis. Okay, so Antonidas is not one of the people? Hmm. Despite the man's bluster, the dragon respected the other mage's abilities. Losing Drendon at a time like this could have proven costly. Or maybe he just doesn't exist yet? Uh, no, he does. We must move with caution, he urged. I will speak with you again soon. What are you planning, Krasis? A search into this young noble's past. You think you'll find anything? The hooded wizard shrugged. We can only hope. He dismissed her image, then leaned back to consider. Krasis regretted that he had to lead his associates astray, if only for their own good. At least their intrusions into Deathwing's mortal affairs would have the result of distracting the Black. That would give Krasis a bit more time. He only prayed that no one else would risk themselves as Drendon had done. The Kirin Tor would need their strength intact if the other kingdoms turned on them. His own excursion to visit Malagos had ended with little sense of satisfaction. Malagos had promised only to consider his request. Krasis suspected that the great dragon believed he could deal with Deathwing in his own sweet time. Little did the silver-blue Leviathan realize that time no longer remained for any of the dragons. If Deathwing could not be stopped now, he might never be which left Krasis with one much undesired choice now. I must do it. He had to seek out the other great ones, the other aspects, convince one of them, and he might still gain Malagos' sworn aid. So Deathwing is sort of all the way up until the Cataclysm expansion. He's essentially playing the puppet master, um, which we learn in Shadowlands that there's an even greater puppet master, the Nathrazim. Um... But yeah, it's like we just keep peeling back layers and upon layers and learning that there are these greater puppet masters behind each of all everything that's tying them all together. They can only do that for so long. So I wonder how the, how the new Dragonflight expansion is going to up the games, change track, maybe just give us a fresh start. I don't know. Yet She of the Dreaming ever proved a most elusive figure, which meant that Krasis' best bet lay in contacting the Lord of Time, whose servants had already rejected the wizard's requests more than once. Still, what else could he do but try again? Krasis rose, hurrying to a bench upon which many of the items of his calling stood arranged in vials and flasks. He scanned row upon row of jars, eyes quickly passing chemicals and magical items that would have left his counterparts in the Kirin Tor greatly envious and more than a little curious as to how he could have obtained many of the articles in question, if they ever realized just how long he had been practicing the arts. There, a small flask containing a single withered flower caused him to pause. The Eon Rose. Found only in one place in all the world, plucked by Krasis himself to give to his mistress, his love. Saved by Krasis when the orcs stormed the lair and to his disbelief took her and the others prisoner. The Eon Rose. 
five petals of astonishingly different hues surrounding a golden sphere in the center. As Crasis lifted the top of the flask, a faint scent that suddenly recalled his adolescence wafted under his nose. With some hesitation, he reached in, took hold of the faded bloom, and marveled as it, as it suddenly returned to its legendary brilliance the moment his tapering fingers touched it. Fiery red, emerald green, snowy silver, deep sea blue, midnight black. Each petal radiated such beauty as artists only dreamed of. No other object could surpass its inherent beauty. No other flower could match its wondrous scent. Holding his breath for a moment, Crasis crushed the wondrous bloom. He let the fragments fall into his other hand. A tingle spread from his palms to his fingers, but the dragon mage ignored it. Holding the remnants up high over his head, the wizard muttered words of power, then threw what was left of the fabled rose to the floor. But as the crushed pieces touched the stone, they turned suddenly to sand. Sand that spread across the chamber floor, overwhelmed the chamber itself, washed across the chamber, covering everything, eating away everything, and leaving Crasis abruptly standing in the midst of an endless swirling desert. Yet no desert such as this had any mortal, or even Crasis himself for that matter, ever witnessed. For here lay scattered as far as the eye could see, fragments of walls, cracked and scoured statues, rusted weapons, and the mage gasped. Even the half-buried bones of some gargantuan beast that in life had dwarfed even dragons. There were buildings, too, and although at first one might have thought they and the relics around them all part of one vast civilization, a closer look revealed that no one structure too truly belonged with another. A teetering tower such as might have been built by humans in Lordaeron, overshadowed a dome building that surely had come from the dwarves. Some distance farther, an arched temple its roof caved in hinted of the lost kingdom of Azeroth. Nearer to Crasis himself stood a more dour domicile, the quarters of some orc chieftain. A ship large enough to carry a dozen men stood propped on a dune, the latter half of it buried under sand. Armor from the reign of the first king of Stromgard littered another smaller dune. The leaning statue of an elven cleric seemed to say final prayers over both vessel and armor. An astonishing and probable display that gave even Crasis pause. In truth, the sights before the wizard resembled nothing more than some gargantuan deity's macabre collection of antiquities, a point not far from fact. None of these artifacts were native to this realm. In fact, no race, no civilization had ever been spawned here. All the wonders that stood before the wizard had been gathered quite meticulously and over a period of countless centuries from other points all over the world. Crasis could scarcely believe what he saw, for the effort alone staggered even his imagination. To bring such relics, so many of them so massive or so delicate, to this place. Yet despite all of it, despite the spectacle before his eyes, an impatience began to build up as Crasis waited, and waited, and waited more with not even the slightest hint that anyone acknowledged his presence. His patience, already left ragged by the events of the past weeks, finally snapped. He fixed his gaze on the stony features of a massive statue, part man, part bull, whose left arm thrust forth as if demanding that the newcomer leave and called out, I know you are here, Nosdormu. I know it. I would speak with you. The moment the dragon mage finished, the wind whipped up, tossing sand all about and obscuring his vision. Grace's stayed his ground as a full-fledged sandstorm suddenly buffeted him. The wind howled around him so loud that he had to cover his ears. The storm seemed determined to lift him up and throw him far away, but the wizard fought it, using magic as well as physical effort to remain. He would not be turned away, not without the opportunity to speak. At last, even the sandstorm appeared to realize that he would not be deterred. It swept away from him, now focusing on a dune a short distance away. A funnel of dust arose, pushing higher and higher into the sky. The funnel took on a shape, a dragon shape. As large as, if not larger than Malagos, this sandy creation moved, stretched dusty brown wings. Sand continued to add to the dimension of the behemoth, but sand seemingly mixed with gold, for more and more the leviathan forming before Crasis glittered in the blazing light of the desert sun. The wind died, yet not one grain of sand or gold broke from the draconic giant. The wings flapped hard, the neck stretched. Eyelids opened, revealing gleaming gemstones the color of the sun. Coril Stras, the sandy behemoth practically spat. You dare disturb my rest. You dare disturb my peace. I dare because I must, O great lord of time. Titles will not appease my wrath. It would be best if you went. The gemstones flared. 
and went, No, no, not until I speak to you of a danger to all dragons, to all creatures. And as Dormu snorted, a cloud of, cloud of sand bathed Krasis, but his spells kept it from affecting him. One could never tell what magic might dwell within each and every grain in the domain of Nosdormu. One bit of sand might be enough to ensure that the history of a dragon named Coriel Straws turned out never to have happened. Krasis might simply cease to exist unremembered, even by his beloved mistress. Dragons, you say, of what concern is that to you? I see only one dragon here, and it is certainly not the mortal wizard, Krasus, not any more. Away with you. I would return to my collection. You waste too much of my precious time already. One wing swept protectively over the statue of the man bull. So much to gather. So much to catalog. I feel like this is definitely the earliest proto forms of the great dragon aspects. They've changed a lot in their demeanor and temperament. Um, probably for the better, but this is kind of like, I think probably one of the first, if not the first time they're, they're appearing in a novel form. It suddenly infuriated Krasis that this, one of the greatest of the five aspects, he through whom time itself coursed, this dragon cared not a whit what went on in the present or the future. Only his precious collection of the world's past meant anything to the Leviathan. He sent out his servants, his people, to gather whatever they could find, all so that their master could surround himself with what had once been and ignore what was and what might be. Yeah, see, that's not true. He's arguably the most important of them, and he can travel through time so he wouldn't need to send minions to collect relics. All so that he in his own way could ignore the passing of their kind, just as Malikos did, it was Dormu, he shouted, demanding the glittering sand dragon's attention again. Deathwing lives! To his horror, Nosdormu took in his, this terrible news with little change. The golden brown behemoth snorted once more, sending a second cloud assailing the tinier figure. Yes, and so... Taken aback, Krasis managed to blurt, you know, a question not at all worth answering. No, if you've nothing more with which to further bother me, it is time for you to depart. The dragon reared his head, bejeweled eyes flaring. Wait! For going any sense of dignity, the wizard waved his arms back and forth. To his relief, Nosdormu paused, negating the spell he had been about to use to rid himself of this bothersome might. If you know that the Dark One lives, you know what he intends. How can you ignore that? Because, as with all things, even Deathwing will pass into time. Even he will eventually be part of my collection. But if you joined, you've had your say. The glittering sand dragon rose higher, and as he did, the desert flew up, adding further to his girth and form. Torn free by the wind, some of the smaller objects in Nosdormu's bizarre collection joined with that sand, becoming for the moment a very part of the dragon. Now leave me be. The winds now whipped up around Krasis and only Krasis. Try as he might, this time the dragon wizard could not hold his ground. He stumbled back, shoved hard time and again by the ferocious gusts. I came here for the sake of all of us, Krasis managed to shout. You should not have disturbed my rest. You should not have come at all. The glittering gemstones flared. In fact, that would have been best of all. A column of sand shot up from the ground, engulfing the helpless wizard. Krasis could see nothing else. It grew stifling, impossible to breathe. He tried to cast a spell in order to save himself, but against the might of one of the aspects, against the master of time, even his substantial powers proved minuscule. Bereft of air, Krasis finally succumbed. Consciousness fading, he slumped forward and watched in startlement as the petals of the Eon Rose dropped to the stone floor of his sanctum without any effect. The spell should have worked. He should have been transported to the realm of Nosdormu, lord of the centuries. Just as Malagos embodied magic itself, so too did Nosdormu represent time and timelessness. 
one of the most powerful of the five aspects, he would have proven a powerful ally, especially should Malico suddenly choose to retreat into his madness. Without Nosdormu, Krasis' hopes of success dwindled much. Kneeling, the mage picked up the petals and repeated the spell. For his troubles, Krasis was re rewarded only with a horrendous headache. How could that be, though? He had done everything right. The spell should have worked. Unless somehow Nosdormu had caught wind of the wizard's intention to plead with him and had cast a spell preventing Krasis from entering the Sandy Realm. He swore. Without a chance to visit Nosdormu, he had no hope however slight it might have been in the first place, of convincing the powerful dragon to join his plan. That left only she of the dreaming, the most elusive of the aspects, and the only one he had never ever spoken with in all his lengthy life. Crisis did not even know how to contact her, for it had often been said that Isera lived not wholly in the real world, that to her the dreams were the reality. The dreams were the reality? A desperate plan occurred to the wizard, one that, had it been suggested to him by any of his counterparts, would have made Krasis break from his accustomed form and laugh loud. How utterly ridiculous, how utterly hopeless. But as with Nosdormu, what other choice did he have? Turning back to his array of potions, artifacts, and powders, Krasis searched for a black vial. He found it quickly, despite not having touched it in more than a century. The last time he had made use of it, it had been to slay what had seemed unslayable. Now, however, he sought to only borrow one of its most vicious traits, and hoped that he did not measure wrong. Three drops on the tip of a single bolt had killed the Manta, the behemoth of the deep. Three drops had slain a creature ten times the size and strength of a dragon. Like Deathwing, nearly all had believed the Manta unstoppable. Now Krasis intended to take some of the poison for himself. The deepest sleep, the deepest dreams, he muttered to himself as he took the vial down. That is where she must be where she has to be. From another shelf he removed a cup and a small flask of pure water. Measuring out a single swallow in the cup, the dragon mage then opened the vial. With the greatest caution, he brought the open bottle to the cup of water. Three drops to slay in seconds the manta. How many drops to assist Krasis on the most treacherous of journeys? Sleep and death. They were so very close in nature, more so than most realized. Surely he would find Isera there. The tiniest drop he could measure fell silently into the water. Krasis replaced the top on the vial, then took up the cup. A bench, he murmured. Best to use a bench. One immediately formed behind him, a well-cushioned bench upon which the King of Lordaeron would have happily slept. Krasis, too, intended to sleep well on it. Perhaps forever. <clears throat> he sat upon it, then raised the cup to his lips. Yet before he could bring himself to drink what might be his last... The dragon in human guise made one last toast. To you, my Alexstrasza, always to you. There was someone here, all right, Verisa muttered, studying the ground. One of them was human, the other I can't be certain about. Pray tell, how do you know the difference? asked Falstad, squinting. He could not tell one sign from another. In fact, he could not even see half of what the elf saw. Look here, this boot print. She indicated a curved mark in the dirt. These are human-style boots, tight-fitting and uncomfortable. I'll take your word, and the other, the one you can't identify. The ranger straightened. Well, clearly there are no signs of a dragon being around, but there are tracks over here that match nothing I know. She knew that once again Felstad could not see what to her sharp eyes screamed out their curious presence. The dwarf did his best, though, studying the peculiar striations in the earth. You mean these, my elven lady? The marks appeared to flow toward where the human, surely Ronin, had at one time or another stood, yet they were not footprints, not even paw prints. To her eyes, it looked as if something had floated, dragging something else behind it. This gets us no closer than the first spot this little grain beast brought us to, Falstead seized Krill by the scruff of his neck. The goblin had both hands tied behind him and a rope around his waist, the other end of which had been tied around the neck of the griffin. Despite that, neither Verisa nor the wild dwarf trusted that their unwilling companion might not somehow escape. Falstad especially kept his eye on Krill. Well, now what? It is becoming clear to me that you're leading us around. I doubt you've even seen the wizard. I have, I have, yes, I have. Krill smiled wide, possibly in the hope of swaying his captors, but a goblin's toothy grin did little to impress those outside of their race. Described him, didn't I? You know I saw him, don't you? Verisa noticed the griffin sniffing at something hidden behind a bit of foliage. Using her sword, she prodded at the spot, then dragged out the object in question. 
On the tip of her sword hung a small, empty wine sack. The elf brought it to her nose. A heavenly bouquet wafted past. The elf briefly closed her eyes. Falstead misread her expression. As bad as all that, must be dwarven ale. On the contrary, I have not come across such a fabulous aroma, even at the table of my lord back in Quelf the Loss. Whatever wine filled this sack far outshone even the best of his stock. Which means to my feeble mind, dropping the sack, Farisa shook her head. I do not know, but somehow I cannot help thinking that it means that Ronan was here, if only for a time. Her companion gave her a skeptical look. My elven lady, is it possible that you simply wish it to be true? Can you answer me who else might have been in this region drinking wine fit for kings? Oi, the dark one, after he'd sucked the marrow from the bones of your wizard. His words made her shiver, but she remained steadfast in her belief. No, if Deathwing brought him this far, he had some other reason than as a repast. Possible, I suppose. Still holding onto the goblin, Felstead glanced up at the darkening sky. If we hope to get much farther before night, we'd best be getting on our way. Verisa touched the tip of her blade against Krill's throat. We need to deal with this one first. What's to deal with? Either we take him with us, or do the world a favor and leave it with one less goblin to worry about. No, I promised I would release him. The dwarf's heavy brow furrowed. I don't think that's wise. Nevertheless, I made that promise. She stared hard at him, knowing that if he understood elves as much as he should, Falstad would see the sense in not pursuing this argument. Sure enough, the Griffin Rider nodded, albeit with much reluctance. Oi, does as you say. You made a promise, and I'll not be the one to try to sway you. Not quite under his breath, he added, not with only one lifetime inmate to me. Satisfied, Verisa expertly cut the bonds around Krill's wrists, then removed the loop from his waist. The goblin fairly bounced around, so overjoyed did he seem by his release. Thank you, my benevolent mistress. Thank you. The ranger turned the tip of the sword back toward the creature's throat. Before you go, there were a few last questions. Do you know the path to Grimbatal? Falstead did not take this question well. Brow arched, he muttered. What are you thinking? She purposely ignored his question. Well, Krill's eyes had gone wide the moment she asked. The goblin looked ashen, or at least a paler shade of green. No one goes to Grimbatal, benevolent mistress. What's then? Dragons, too. Dragons eat goblins. Answer my question. He swallowed, then finally bobbed his oversized head up and down. Yes, mistress, I know the way. Do you think the wizard is there? You can't be serious, Verisa. Fal Falstead rumbled, so upset he had for once called her by name. If your Ronin is in Grimbatol, then he's lost to us. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Falstead, I think he always wanted to reach that place and not simply to observe the orcs. I think he has some other reason, although what it could have to do with Deathwing I cannot say. Maybe he plans on releasing the Dragon Queen single-handedly, the Griffin Rider returned with a snort of derision. He's a mage, after all, and everyone knows that they're all mad. An absolutely absurd notion, but for a moment it gave Verice a pause. No, it could not be that. Krill, meanwhile, seemed to be trying to think really hard about something, something that did not at all look to please him. At last, his face screwed up in an expression of distaste. He muttered, Mistress wants to go to Grimbatal. The ranger considered it. It went even beyond her oath, but she had to push forward. Yes, yes, I do. Now say here, mate. You do not have to come with me if you do not want to, Falstad. I thank you for your aid thus far, but I can proceed from here alone. The dwarf shook his head vehemently. I'd leave you alone in the middle of our territory with only this untrustworthy little wretch. Nay, my elven lady. Falstad will not leave a fair damsel, however capable a warrior she might also be, on her own. We go together. In truth, she appreciated his company here. You may turn back at any time, though, remember that. Only if you are with me. She glanced again at Krill. Well, can you tell me the way? Cannot tell you, mistress. More and more, the spindly creature's expression soured. Best. Best if I show you instead. This surprised her. I granted you your freedom, Krill. For which this poor wretch is so eternally grateful, mistress, but only one path to Grimbatol offers certainty, and without me, he dared look slightly egotistical, neither elf nor dwarf will find it. We've got my mounted little rodent, we'll simply fly over. In the land of dragons, the goblin chuckled a hint of madness there. 
There's the fly right into their mouths and be done with it then. Nah, to enter Grimbatol, if that is truly what Mistress desires, you all have to follow me. Falstead would not hear of that and immediately protested, but Varisa saw no choice but to do as the goblin suggested. Krill had led them true so far, and although she did not, of course, trust him entirely, she felt certain that she would recognize if he tried to lead them astray. Besides, clearly the goblin wanting nothing to do with Grimbatol himself, or else why would he have been where they had found him? Any of this kind who served the orcs would have been in the mountain fortress, not wandering the dangerous wilds of Cosmodon. And if he could lead her yet to Ronin. Having convinced herself that she chose correctly, Verisa faced the dwarf. I will go with him, Falstad. It is the best, the only choice I have. His broad shoulders slumping, Falstad sighed. Tis against my better judgment, but I, I'll go with you. If only to keep an eye on this one, so I can lop off his traitorous head if I prove right. Krill must be going foot the entire way. The misshapen little creature mused for a moment, then replied, No, can travel some distance with Griffin. He gave her a smile full of teeth. No, just where B should land. Despite his apparent misgivings, Falstead started for the Griffin. Just tell us where to go, you little rodent. The sooner we're there, the sooner you can be on your way. The goblin's weight added little to the powerful animal's burden, and soon the griffin was on its way. Falstead, of course, sat in front, the better to control his mount. Krill sat behind him, with Verisa taking up the rear. The elf had resheathed her sword and now held a dagger ready, just in case their undesired companion attempted something. Yet although the goblin's directions were not always the clearest, Verisa saw nothing that hinted of duplicity. He kept them near to the ground and always guided them along paths that steered them from the open areas. In the distance, the mountains of Grimbatal grew nearer. A sense of anxiety spread through the ranger as she realized that she approached her goal, but that anxiousness was tempered by the fact that even now she had come across no sign of either Ronin or the Black Dragon. Surely this close to the mountain fortress the orcs would have been able to sight such a leviathan. And as if thinking of dragons allowed one to conjure them up, Falstad suddenly pointed east where a massive form rose into the sky. Big, he called, big and red as fresh blood, scout from Grimbatol. Krill immediately acted. Down there, the goblin pointed at a ravine. Many places to hide, even for a griffin. With little other choice, the dwarf obeyed, guiding his mount earthward. The dragon's form grew larger and larger, but Verisa noted that the crimson beast also headed in a more northerly direction, possibly to the very northern border of Cosmodon, where the last desperate forces of the Horde sought to hold back the alliance. That made her wonder about the situation there. Had the humans begun their advance at last? Could the Alliance itself even now be halfway to Grimbatol? If so, it would still be too late for her purposes, yet the nearing presence of the Alliance might aid in one way, if it made the orcs here concentrate on matters other than their own immediate defenses. The griffin alighted in the ravine, the animal instinctively seeking the shadows. No coward, the griffin had the sense to know when to choose a battle. Marisa and the others leapt off, finding their own places to hide. Krill pressed himself against one rocky wall, his expression that of open terror, the ranger actually found herself feeling some sympathy for him. They waited for several minutes, but the dragon did not fly by. After what seemed far too long a time, the impatient ranger decided to see for herself if the beast had changed direction. Getting a proper grip on the rock, she climbed up. The elf saw nothing in the darkening sky, not even a speck. In fact, Verisa suspected that they could have departed this ravine long before if only one of them had dared look. No sign, whispered Falstead, climbing up beside her. For a dwarf, he proved himself quite nimble crawling up the side. We are clear. Very much so. Good. Unlike my hill cousins, I've no taste for holes in the ground. He started down. All right, Krill. The danger's done. You can pale yourself. The moment his voice cut off, Risa jerked her head around. What is it? That damned spawn of a frog's gone. He scrambled down the rest of the way. Vanished like a wisp. Dropping down as safely as she could, the ranger joined Falstad in scanning the immediate area. Sure enough, despite the fact that they should have been able to see the goblin's retreating figure in either direction, not one sign of Krill existed. Even the griffin acted baffled, as if it too had not even noticed that the spindly creature had run off. How could he have just disappeared? Wish I knew that myself, my dear elven lady. A neat trick. Can your griffin hunt him down? Why not just let him go? We're better off without him. Because I... The ground underneath her feet suddenly softened, broke apart. The elf's boots sank deep within seconds. 
Thinking that she had walked into mud, she tried to pull free. Instead, Verisa only sank deeper and at an alarming rate. It almost felt as if she was being pulled down. What in the name of the airy? Falstead too had sunk deep, but in the dwarf's case, that meant he suddenly stood up to his knees in dirt. Like the ranger, he attempted to extricate himself, only to completely fail. Verisa grabbed for the nearest rock face, trying to seize hold. For a moment, she succeeded, managing to slow her progress downwards. Then something powerful seemed to take hold of her ankles, pulling with such force that the ranger could no longer keep her grip. Above them, she heard a panicked squawk. Unlike Verisa and the dwarf, the griffin had managed to pull up in time to avoid being dragged under. The animal fluttered above Falstad's head, trying it seemed to get a grip on its master. However, as the beast dropped lower, columns of dirt suddenly shot up, trying, Verisa realized in horror, to seize the mount. The griffin narrowly escaped, forced now to fly up so high that the animal could not possibly aid either warrior, which left Verisa with no notion as to how to escape. Already the earth came up to her waist. The thought of being buried alive set even the elf on edge, yet in comparison to Falstad's predicament, hers seemed slightly less immediate. The dwarf's shorter stature meant that he already had trouble keeping his head above ground. Try as he might, even the mighty strength of the griffin rider could not help him. He grabbed furiously at the soft earth, ripping up handfuls that did him no good whatsoever. In desperation, the ranger reached out. Falstead, my hand! Reach for it! He tried. They both tried. The gap between them had grown too great, however. In growing horror, Verisa watched as her struggling companion was inevitably pulled under. My was all he managed before disappearing from sight. Now buried up to her chest, she froze for a moment, staring at the slight mound of dirt that was all that remained to mark his passage. The ground there did not even stir. No last thrust of a hand, no wild movement underneath. Falstead, she murmured. Renewed force at her ankles tugged her deeper. As the dwarf had done, Verisa snatched at the earth around her, digging deep valleys with her fingers, but doing herself no good. Her shoulders sank in. She lifted her head skyward. Of the griffin, she saw no sign but another figure, so very familiar, now leaned out from a small crevice that the elf had missed earlier. Even in the waning light, she could see Krill's toothy smile. Forget me, my mistress, but the dark one insists that no one interfere. So he left me the task of seeing to your deaths. Menial bit of work for one undeserving of a clever mind such as mine. But my master does, after all, have very large teeth and so sharp claws. I certainly couldn't refuse him, could I? His grin stretched wider. I hope you understand. Damn you. The ground swallowed her up. Dirt filled the elf's mouth, then seemingly her hungry lungs. She blacked out. Well, someone's gonna either save them or he's messing with them. But that seems weird, the fact that he said he's got to kill them. All right. We got a cliffhanger on that one. This episode in the pipes, five by five. I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing everyone next time on Lore of Warcraft.